The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Welcome back to Element 14 Presents. I'm Derek, and today I want to talk to you about analog to digital converters, or ADCs, specifically successive approximation register ADCs. Now these are typically the kind that you would find in a garden variety microcontroller or your Arduino. In our firmware, you may have done this in the past where you need to start the conversion bit and you need to wait for the conversion process to complete. That takes a certain amount of time. What goes on between those two time points? Well, that's part of what we're going to look at today. I've built up a kind of blown apart analog to digital converter on the breadboard behind me. We are going to take a look at that. We're going to probe some waveforms so we can better understand what's going on during that process. Of course, no Element 14 video would be complete without a project, so I've chosen a fairly typical example of taking an analog temperature sensor. We're going to read that value into the ADC of an 8-bit microcontroller, and then I found this really cool uh, LED bubble display from you know the early 80s off of eBay, and we're going to read that value and display it on that display. We've got a lot of ground to cover, so I'm excited to get into this. I hope you guys learned something from this video, so let's get started. Amazing Hacks Inspired Designs. Each week, Element 14 Presents brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. The entire purpose of performing the analog to digital conversion process is so that we can take a changing analog voltage, sample and quantize it in order to bin its digital value over some voltage range. We might do this so that we can take something like a potentiometer's variable voltage and use the digital value to control some other digital circuit like a timer or some LEDs. Or in the case of our project, we'll be sampling an analog temperature sensor and outputting the results on a seven segment display. In order to do that, we need to define some conditions. The first is our reference voltage or VREF. This defines the voltage range that we expect to measure on the ADC's analog input pin. In our case, it'll be from 0 volts to 5 volts, so VREF is equal to 5. The second thing we should consider is the number of bits that we have to work with. The larger the number of bits, the finer granularity we have when measuring an analog voltage. This directly affects the resolution of the ADC. For our demonstration, I've breadboarded an 8-bit ADC, so 2 to the power of 8 is equal to 256. Now our resolution becomes 5 divided by 256, which is 0.0195 volts, or 19.5 millivolts. This means that over the range from 0 to 5 volts at our input, each quantized step is the equivalent of 0.0195 volts. This gives our converted digital value a certain weight to each bit. Now many different types of ADCs exist, but I thought it worth mentioning some main players in this graph. You can see that each type of ADC has its advantages and disadvantages when it comes to resolution and speed. The fastest being the flash ADC, which is composed of mainly comparators. It is extremely fast and convert an analog signal in a single clock cycle. The downside is that it's power hungry and consumes a lot of real estate on a single chip. The success of approximation register is fairly quick in its conversion speed and offers a good middle range solution, so is used quite frequently in your common microcontrollers. Delta Sigma offers a very wide bit range, but not all that fast in its conversion speed. The dual slope ADC is the slowest of the bunch, but pretty cheap to implement. There are, of course, many more types of ADCs, but this just gives you an idea of why certain types of topologies are used for different applications. For our project, I designed the case in FreeCAD to be milled out of billet aluminum. Unfortunately, due to a corrupted SD card, I lost a bunch of footage showing the completed project. But after epoxying the tube in place and a quick coat of paint at my professional cardboard paint booth, things are looking a little more finished. The circuit board was designed in KiCad, and for this project, I decided to use a white solder mask to help reflect the internal red LED lighting around the inside of the enclosure and, well, just to make it look cool and like something you'd see in a sci-fi movie. But before we get to the electronics, let's talk a little bit more about the ADC conversion process. At the heart of many analog to digital converters is the comparator. It is used to provide a digital indication of whether our input voltage we're measuring is greater than or less than a local voltage that we can manipulate for comparison. In this example, we are comparing an analog input voltage to the voltage provided by a potentiometer. As we ramp the potentiometer's voltage at the negative or inverting input and exceed the voltage we're trying to measure at the positive or non-inverting input, the digital output of the comparator goes from a high state to a low state. 
I should also note that ADCs always have a sample and hold circuit to act as a buffer between the changing AC waveform we're measuring and the rest of the circuit. As we've already said, the conversion process takes a certain amount of time, and the input voltage could change during that window, causing inaccurate results. In our breadboarded circuit, we're just measuring a static voltage, so I've omitted this part of the circuit for clarity. So now that we understand what a comparator is, let's go ahead and look at it on the breadboard. We'll check out some waveforms. And what we're going to do is we have a fixed voltage at half the supply rail between 0 and 5 volts, which is 2.5 volts. So I have a voltage divider that's kind of simulating the sample and hold circuit at the non-inverting input of the comparator. On the inverting side of the comparator, I have a potentiometer, and we're going to be able to just sweep that voltage up from 0 volts to 5 volts, and we'll watch the output of the comparator change. Okay, so here are my three waveforms. The purple is the output of my comparator. The yellow is going to be our fixed voltage from the sample and hold circuit, which is 2.5 volts. And of course, the bottom one is our potentiometer. Now, as I raise the voltage from zero volts on the potentiometer up and I pass, I surpass the voltage we're measuring, the output of the comparator goes low. Okay, and that's gonna be useful in the next part of our circuit. And of course, the opposite holds true if I lower my potentiometer below this uh, voltage we're measuring, the output of the comparator swings in the opposite direction. So before we take a look at the success of approximation register, we're going to go back a little bit and talk about the counter ADC. Um, you can con configure this as a count up or count down converter, but it's a circuit that's special to me. I know I'm a total nerd, but back a couple hundred years ago when I was in college, this circuit kind of uh, turned me on to digital electronics. Up to that point, everything was all analog, analog. But this uh, kind of showed me, you know, bridging of both worlds and looking at the waveforms on the oscilloscope um, kind of triggered something of uh, interest for me as far as digital goes. So I hope you get a kick out of it. Let's start probing around and see how this counter ADC works. For the counter-based ADC, sometimes called a count up or count down ADC, depending on the configuration, we're still using the comparator to compare our input voltage against a local voltage that we can manipulate. However, instead of a potentiometer, we're using a counter and a digital to analog converter to sweep our local voltage digitally. Once our startup conversion process switch is pressed, the up counter is fed by a clock signal as long as our local voltage is below our analog input voltage. This provides an 8-bit wide binary count to the digital to analog converter. The resulting waveform at the DAC is a step voltage that increases and attempts to count up to 255. If it meets or exceeds the voltage we're measuring, then the comparator output goes low, terminating the count and signaling that the conversion process is complete. This in turn causes the digital value that was driving our digital to analog converter to latch at our output register. Now this is a lot to wrap your head around initially, but if we look at the process on the oscilloscope, it becomes more clear. Here's the breadboard circuit. At the top, we have a clock source coming from my function generator. It drives the clock, which is a mod 256 counter, and counts up digitally from 0 to 255. This in turn drives the analog to digital converter that produces our local voltage ramp waveform. The comparator, which we're very familiar with at this point, compares the local voltage to our measured voltage, which is this yellow wire here. Again, I'm just using a potentiometer for demonstration. At the bottom of the screen is the latch, which stores the final result of the conversion process. Okay, so now what we're probing is the comparator output here. That's our purple trace. We have a potentiometer, this yellow trace here. So you can see as I turn the potentiometer, it goes up and down. That's going to represent the voltage that we're measuring this time. And the lower trace here is our local voltage that we're going to ramp up. Okay, we're going to ramp up and try to cross over that. Let's see what happens. I'll press the single shot mode and press the start of conversion bit button. All right, now you can see exactly what's going on. So we're counting and our digital to analog converter is stepping up and up and up until we cross the threshold of what we're measuring. The comparator output goes low and our data gets latched. Now, this is what it looks like. Nothing all that special, we're just counting up digitally until we hit that mark. So the one of the disadvantages of this kind of converter is, what if I'm measuring a small voltage? Single shot mode, press the button, and you can see we don't count up very high. Now this conversion process completed very quickly. What happens if I'm measuring a higher voltage? I'm gonna crank up my potentiometer close to the supply rail or close to the upper end of VREF. Single shot mode, trigger the conversion. 
Now you can see it took a very long time for that conversion process to complete. So the conversion time will vary depending on the voltage that you're measuring. That's not the best uh, option when you're using an ADC. You don't really have a predictable conversion time. So the successive approximation register makes an improvement upon that. Hi, my name is James and this is my electronics workbench. Together, we host Workbench Wednesdays. It is a show where I review electronics tools and equipment. Whether you are on a hobbyist budget or trying to equip a professional workstation, we've got you covered. Look for new episodes on Wednesdays and come connect with me at element14.com slash workbench Wednesdays. So now we're finally talking about successive approximation registers. In our previous circuit, we saw that when we used the counter to manipulate the digital to analog converter and create a ramp voltage, that wasn't the most effective way of doing it. So in this example, we're gonna pull out that counter and we're going to replace it with the successive approximation register control logic. Now there are some rules that we have to follow. What are those rules? Well, if we have an eight bit counter, okay, we need eight bits worth of data here that we can use to manipulate the digital to analog converter that's internal. And instead of creating the ramp, like we said, we're going to kind of shift some voltages around. And what's gonna happen is we're going to, uh, through a sequence of events, kind of narrow in, okay, on that voltage that we're measuring. And the way that we do that is basically taking VREF, chopping it in half initially, okay, by, with this word here, we're going to set the first bit. When we set the first bit, that's in the equivalent of 128 in decimal. That is half of our range. Remember, our range is from zero, all zeros, to all ones, which is 255. Half of that is 128. Then we're going to compare that using our comparator to the actual voltage. And that'll determine what we do next. If we are below it, we're going to keep that bit set so that our, our value is shifted up, okay? And then we are going to prepare for the next test. So we're going to set the next bit down towards our least significant bit. And what that's going to do is reduce our range again by half. So we keep doing that process over and over and over, and our voltage keeps minimizing and minimizing and kind of narrowing in on our value. So as we saw, the successive approximation register uh, converts the voltage to a digital value within eight cycles, where the counter takes quite a bit longer than that. It's somewhat unpredictable in its conversion time. Um, now I wanna talk a little bit more about our project here, which I've just kind of soldered all the wires together and I'll take you through uh, how I designed this thing and some improvements I'd probably make. So come on closer and we'll put this thing together and uh, explain a little bit more about how it works. So here is of course the enclosure and uh, I had this milled, like I said, out of billet aluminum. It was a little thicker than I'd wanted to make it and the reason for that is I had a coin cell on the back side and it turns out that that coin cell could only provide 40 milliamps and with the circuit actually full on and running, it was drawing that much. So my VREF actually comes from the um, 2.5 volt internal VREF in the chip and with the, uh, drawing that much current, uh, the VREF couldn't supply the correct voltage of 2.5 volts, it was actually sagging. So what I ended up doing was taking two CR2025s and putting them in parallel inside of this um, electrical tape here. So I thought that might be an issue, which is why I made it wider. I made the standoffs on the back side a little thicker in case I had to mount that battery in there, which I ended up having to do. The business end is the MCP9700, which is an analog um, Celsius temperature sensor. And uh, I've heat shrunk it here. There's epoxy inside. I had to kind of trim the sides to get it to fit inside the tube. We'll mount that in. We'll epoxy that in place. On the end, we will put this uh, stainless steel bearing. I just have this magnet here to keep it from rolling around. And uh, that'll hopefully transfer heat to this package using 
a thermally conductive epoxy adhesive. So here's the uh, back side of the circuit board, I guess you could say, and I'm using a reed switch. Uh, so if I put a magnet near it, the circuit board actually turns on, which is kind of a neat feature. Okay, if I move the magnet away, it turns off. How practical that is, I don't really know. Probably not very practical, but I didn't really have any room in the enclosure for a switch. I'm using an EFM8 BusyBee, and in the majority of the time, it's always connected to the battery, but the majority of the time it's in sleep mode, and it wakes up periodically to check to see if this um, read switch is triggered. If it is, uh, the watchdog timer resets and it stays on all the time. These are all the resistors for the uh, seven segment display. And for the seven segment display, I am actually scanning each digit one at a time. So this one is on, the other two are off. This one is off, this one is on. So it's always scanning. That's really just a method to uh, conserve power, especially when you're operating off of the battery. And just to point out the way that this thing right now is holding itself together, I kind of ran out of time and I didn't uh, put any provisions in for screws on the back side. I'm actually, I've got uh, these metal tabs and there are magnets on the back base plate here that stick to them and keep, keeps everything closed. Battery slides in like that. It's a bit messy, the cables are a little too long. And you might say, well, you have wires running through the temperature probe. These are actually these really fine Teflon wires that I found um, online and man, they work great. So I'm impressed with those. Goes together like that. A reed switch just kind of hangs in here. Magnetic field will actually go through the aluminum, so that's not an issue. TO92 package fits right in there. Okay, I'm gonna leave it protruding for a little bit and I'm gonna put some epoxy on that ball. No, oh, it's a little looser than I thought it was gonna be. No! All right, there we go. Okay, and last but not least, I have a little acrylic window that I made on my acrylic bending jig. And there we have it. Let's get a magnet and see if we can turn this thing on. Uh -huh, pretty slick. All right, let's, uh, let's heat it up and run it through its paces. Well, as it turns out, if I just pop the battery on the backside, it uh, turns on and stays on. That was completely intentional. Mm, right. Okay, so I'm gonna take my hot air station here and I'm gonna heat up the end and we can watch the uh, digits change and make sure it works. Of course, I have really no reference uh, to compare it to, so we'll just make sure that it ramps up. And it appears to be working. I love it. It'll be a nice addition to the bench. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, we covered quite a few things, but ADCs are an extremely broad topic, especially when you're dealing with high speed signals. Uh, this video is just meant to cover the basics, the very basics of ADCs. I mean, we barely scratched the surface. Uh, we covered uh, resolution, different types of ADCs, the more popular ones. Uh, we covered uh, counter type ADCs and how that translates into successive approximation registers. And now if there was anything that I would change about this um, would be the switch mechanism. It was kind of nice that it, uh, I found that it worked with this on the end and it actually looks kind of cool. One thing that I'd probably change and I did write code for it was to change from uh, centigrade Celsius to Fahrenheit. Uh, but really I would need some other switch on here and there wasn't a lot of room after I added those two uh, CR2025 batteries in here. So that's probably one thing that I would change. I didn't quite get the um, display lined up on the PCB with the window and I would have put provisions on the back side for some kind of screws instead of this silly magnet setup. Um, the thermal conductivity of this steel ball probably um, could use some improvement. I probably would have been better off just leaving the um, the microchip uh, temperature sensor sticking out instead of using the steel ball. Um, but overall, I think this is a pretty cool little thing. I'm more impressed with it than I thought I was going to be. Uh, so it's cool. I'm gonna use this just to kind of probe around and see if things get hot on boards. Probably be better off with a thermal camera to be honest with you, but hey, at least it looks pretty cool. Um, if you have any projects that you've used analog to digital converters with, uh, let us know down in the comments or at the Element 14 community at element14.com slash presents. Have a good one.